Uh, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today for EMCA's Orchi Day and its effects on World War II, Europe and America. It's a panel discussion in association with AHEPA's Hellenic Cultural Commission and the Hellenic American National uh, Council. Uh, many thanks uh, to, uh, from the National Council to uh, Bill Matarangas and Paul Kotrotsius. My name is uh, Lou Katsos, and uh, this particular event relates to the 80th anniversary of Orchid Day. Uh, I will mo moderate uh, today's panel. Our distinguished panel includes the president of Elis, the Hellenic Institute for Strategic Studies, author, retired Lieutenant General Yanis Baldzois, historian, author, Professor Alexander Kitroff of uh, Haverford uh, College, the museum director of Kehila, Kedosha, Yanina, Marsha, Ikomonopoulos, Ahepa's supreme vice president, entrepreneur Jimmy Kokotas, and historian, researcher, author Peter Yakumis. Orchid Day, which took place on October 28, 1940, is a national Hellenic holiday, and it represents when the Hellenic Prime Minister Metaxas was awoken to respond to a series of demands from the Italian ambassador to Greece, Emmanuel Grassi, which would have allowed foreign Italian troops free reign in Alas, a neutral nation at the time. His response to these demands was a simple ohi or no. Actually, ohi or no was not the response. It was, then it will be war. But ohi or no, really was what the people were saying the very next day and what appeared in the newspapers. This led to battles by the Hellenes of historic international consequences for Europe and the free world. It was the first time in the European theater that an Axis power was defeated after them having taken over country by country, over a dozen countries were actually taken over very, very rapidly. And uh, also it raised the hopes of occupied Europe that the Axis powers can be defeated and caused the Nazi forces, which were scheduled to attack the Soviet Union under Operation Barbarossa to divert their forces and invade Alas instead. This diversion led to a delay in the Nazi invasion of the USSR and the Nazis eventual defeat there in the Soviet winter. Ohi Day was a turning point in World War II and had an importance that went beyond the Hellenic Republic and an event international in scope as we, as we indicated. In addition, despite, despite the ultimate Hellenic defeat, having fought long and hard over a period of six months, the bravery of the Hellenic people during those difficult months also had an effect on changing how Hellenic Americans were perceived in the United States and in the diaspora. It transformed them from being the other to finally being accepted as Americans. These and other aspects of Orchid Day will be explored with our panel. Before we start our panel discussion, however, I would like to introduce uh, Hellenic uh, opera singer Kostas Tsurakis, who will sing a cappella, a couple of Sophia Vembo songs, one before and one after the opening remarks by our esteemed guests, the Hellenic General Secretary for Public Diplomacy and Greeks Abroad, Professor Emeritus Yanis Chrysolakis, and the Hellenic Republic Council General in New York, Dr. Konstantin Kutras. Uh, Kostas uh, uh, Tsurakis is a renowned Hellenic American bass baritone singer who has performed throughout the United States and around the world. Most recently, he appeared in Germany in the title role of Mozart's Don Giovanni. In addition to his passion for performing, Costa is a dedicated music uh, educator who regularly teaches young musicians and is the associate music director at the, at the Archdiocese Cathedral of Holy Trinity in New York. Following in the footsteps of many of his family before him, Costa is a proud member of a HEFA uh, chapter, Delphi 25, uh, which I am an, uh, a member of also. And I was honored, of course, to be its past president. Costa, 
thank you for coming uh, today and please sing uh, your first uh, song. Mestus dromus trirnane, imanades kekitane, nadikrisune. Τα παιδιά τους πορκιστήκαν, στο σταθμό ταν χωριστήκαν, να νικήσουνε. Μα για εκείνους που έχουν φύγει και η δόξα τους στη λίγη, ας χαιρόμαστε. Και ποτέ καμιάς μη κλάψει, κάθε πόνο τη σας κάψει, Κι ας ευχόμαστε. Παιδιά της Ελλάδος, παιδιά, που σκληρά πολεμάτε πάνω στα βουνά. Παναγιά, προσευχόμαστε όλες να έρθετε ξανά. Λέω σώσες αγαπούνε και για κάποιον ξενυχτούνε και στενάζουνε. Πως η πίκρα και η τρεμούλα Σε μια τίμια ελληνοπούλα δεν ταιριάζουνε. Ελληνίδες του ζαλόγου και της πόλης και του λόγου και πλακιώτησες. Όσο κι αν πικρά πονούμε ή περήφανα πούμε σαν σου λιώτησες. Παιδιά της Ελλάδος, παιδιά που σκληρά πολεμάτε πάνω στα βουνά. Παιδιά στη γλυκιά Παναγιά Προσευχόμαστε όλες να έρθετε ξανά. Με τις νίκη στα κλαδιά σας προσμένουμε παιδιά. Thank you, Costa. That was that was fantastic. Yeah, Thank you again, uh, General Secretary for Public uh, Diplomacy and mm. Greeks Abroad, uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Ioannis Chrysolakis, is a graduate of the School of Civil Engineering in the National Technical University of Athens, with a master's degree from the U.S. and a Ph.D. from the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. He has taught at various academic institutions in Elas as well as abroad. He has worked as manager in the public and private sector, has been in charge of large European joint ventures for the production of new technologies and significant international administrative and scientific work. He was elected vice president of the International Association of Schools of Administration and appointed as president of the National Center for Public Administration and Local Government. He has worked with many European countries and in the US collaborating and communicating with various organizations and, and councils of, of local Hellenic communities and with many international organizations. He has participated in a large number of councils, committees and conventions, both in Elas as well as abroad and has had numerous publications and a significant body of work as an author. General Secretary, please. Good evening, dear compatriots, dear friends of Greece. Good evening from Athens. The Secretariat, 
General for Public Diplomacy and Greeks Abroad of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, always together with our expatriates, celebrates the OHI Award this year as well. With that big OHI, Greece was included in World War II against the Axis powers. We managed to stop the initial invasion by pushing the enemy far behind its lines of attack. The Greeks surprised everyone with their courage, determination, and strong resistance against the superpower of the time. But we are well aware that there are no surprises because we know very well that we never give up. The 20th century was marked by this war that came and swept almost the entire planet. It was also marked by the bravery of the Greek fighters who resisting inflicted multiple blows on the enemy. The same fighting spirit remains with us to this day. In World War II, the Greeks were again like Leonidas with his Spartans. They were again seemingly small and weak. We are fighting this battle again and again throughout our history because us Greeks always keep our thermopylae. We are well aware of this war that every time starts with the nohi of ours, and we know how to always be a winner. Αγαπητοί συμπατριώτες, αγαπητοί φίλοι της Ελλάδας, καλησπέρα σας από την Αθήνα. Η Γενική Γραμματεία Δημόσιας Διπλωματίας και Απόδημου Ελληνισμού του Υπουργείου Εξωτερικών, <coughs> πάντα μαζί με τους απόδημούς μας, γιορτάζει και φέτος μια πολύ σημαντική λέξη. Μια λέξη με μόλις τρία γράμματα που όμως σημάδεψε τον ρου του Δεύτερου Παγκοσμίου Πολέμου και χαράχτηκε στη συλλογική μας μνήμη. Το όχι των Ελλήνων αυτή τη φορά στις 28 Οκτωβρίου του 1940 σήμανε τις ειρήνες του πολέμου. Παράλληλα το ίδιο όχι σήμανε και τις καμπάνες του αγώνα μας για την ελευθερία, του αγώνα για την ακαιρεότητα της πατρίδας. <κυρίζει> το μεγάλο όχι των Ελλήνων είναι το όχι που απάντησε η Ελλάδα σε ένα τελεσίγραφο. Το όχι που την ενέταξε αμέσως στον Δεύτερο Παγκόσμιο Πόλεμο εναντίον των δυνάμεων του άξονα. Η Ελλάδα κατάφερε να σταματήσει την αρχική εισβολή αποθώντας τον εχθρό πολύ πίσω από τις γραμμές επίθεσής του. Αυτή είναι η πρώτη ήττα του άξονα και η ελληνική αντεπίθεση έμεινε στην ιστορία ως η πρώτη αποτυχία του άξονα σε ολόκληρο τον Δεύτερο Παγκόσμιο Πόλεμο. Οι Έλληνες εξέπληξαν τους πάντες με το κουράγιο, την αποφασιστικότητά τους και τη στεναρή αντίστασή τους απέναντι στην υπερδύναμη της εποχής. Στην πραγματικότητα όμως, εμείς γνωρίζουμε καλά πως δεν υπάρχει καμιά έκπληξη. Γιατί εμείς γνωρίζουμε πολύ καλά πως οι Έλληνες δεν το βάζουν ποτέ κάτω. Ο 20ος αιώνα σημαδεύτηκε από αυτόν τον πόλεμο που ήρθε και σάρωσε σχεδόν ολόκληρο τον πλανήτη. Σημαδεύτηκε όμως και από τη γενναιότητα των Ελλήνων μαχητών, οι οποίοι αντιστεκόμενοι επέφεραν πολλαπλή σημασία πλήγματα στον εχθρό. Δημιούργησαν συνθήκε πολέμου που κάθε άλλο παρά αναμενόμενες ήταν για τους εισβολείς. Αυτό τα πιστοποιούν και τα λόγια του μεγάλου Τσόρτσιλ. Στο εξή. Δεν θα λέμε πως οι Έλληνες πολεμούν σαν ήρωες, αλλά πως οι ήρωες πολεμούν σαν Έλληνες. Οι ηρωικοί Έλληνες ενωμένοι σε μια δυνατή χρωθιά με αίσθηση του πατριωτικού καθήκοντος πολέμησαν πάντοτε για τις αξίες τους, την αξιοπρέπειά τους και την ελευθερία τους. Όρθωσαν πάντα ένα τεράστιο όχι 
σε αναρρύθμιτες θανάσιμες ανημαντήρησεις. Με το ίδιο όχι, οι πρόγονοί μας αντέκρουσαν πάντοτε τις βολές που προσέβαλαν τον ίδιο μας τον πολιτισμό. Το ίδιο μαχητικό πνεύμα παραμένει μέσα μας μέχρι σήμερα. Η ίδια κάματη ψυχή ανασένει μέσα μας όταν υπερασπιζόμαστε τα δίκαιά μας. Στον Δεύτερο Παγκόσμιο Έλληνα, ε, πόλεμο, οι Έλληνες ήταν ξανά ο Λεωνίδας με τους Σπαρτιάτες του. Ήταν και πάλι φαινομενικά μικρή και αδύναμη. Αυτή τη μάχη τη δίνουμε ξανά και ξανά σε όλη μας την ιστορία. Γιατί εμείς οι Έλληνες είμαστε ταγμένοι να φυλάμε πάντα θερμοπύλες. Το γνωρίζουμε καλά αυτόν τον πόλεμο που κάθε φορά ξεκινά με ένα δικό μας όχι και γνωρίζουμε πώς να βγαίνουμε πάντα νικητές. Ζήτω 28 Οκτωβρίου, ζήτω η Ελλάς, συγχαρητήρια κύριε Κάτσο για την εξαιρετική οργάνωση. Ευχαριστώ. Thank you so, thank you so much, uh, General Secretary. Dr. Kutras has been the Council General of the Hellenic Republic in New York since uh, 2016. He has served in the Hellenic Embassy in Ankara, headed the Justice and Home Affairs Department of Elas's permanent representation to the EU, was a diplomatic counselor to the Ministry of the Ministry for Shipping, Maritime Affairs, and the Aegean, and among other duties, he has served as a spokesperson for the Hellenic Ministry of Foreign mm -hmm. Affairs and headed the ministry's Information and Public Diplomacy Department. He is a graduate of the University of Bonn in Germany and holds a postgraduate uh, uh, diploma in informatics from the University of Athens and a PhD from the University of Bonn. He is, he is a person that we admire in New York. We love him, Dr. Kudras. Uh, Lou, thank you very much for your kind words. Thank you all, dear friends, especially you, Lou, Mr. Secretary General, for doing me the honor to say a few words on our panel discussion today on OHI Day and its effects on World War II. Uh, we have the privilege, dear Lou, of being in the company of so many distinguished guests, all capable of presenting the historical facts with diligence and eloquence. So I will limit myself only to draw some parallels uh, to that day and to uh, the day of, of today, to the current uh, period. With only three days left until our country's OHI Day anniversary, our minds turn to the year 1940, when Greece, as the Secretary General said, literally made history. 80 years later, we remark a historic recurrence. I personally do not believe that history uh, repeats itself, but I do believe in Churchill's words when he said, the longer you can look back, the farther you can look forward. In this context, uh, my friend Lou, we realize that there are factors which play a significant if not definitive role every time history turns the page. The Mediterranean was crucial before, it is now and continue to be in the future, although maybe not in the same magnitude. It is not a coincidence that during World War II, apart from the Pacific theater, the Mediterranean saw the largest naval actions of war it is also very indicative of its importance, the fact that the same theater had the longest duration, five whole years, not to mention that it resulted in Italy's destruction and Germany's loss of strategic position. Coming to today, the Mediterranean region witnesses again several rounds of confrontation. As you know very well, warships come face to face and tension piles up. Much like in the past, strategic position and energy security become the main objective. You might think that centuries of bloodshed would have made modern states more mature in their claims. That rule of law would stand out as one way street when it comes to harnessing our resources. 
But unfortunately, are you as you are all aware, one player does not see it that way. And that player is Turkey. And the bargain she drives is so hard indeed that has left that country cornered and isolated. Alone, as it might be right now, the truth is it takes only one bad apple to spoil the bunch. But Greece and Cyprus do not remain silent spectators, as you know. Nor does France, Lou, nor the United States, nor does Israel or Egypt, nor does Armenia or United Arab Emirates, to mention a few. Our country has taken all steps necessary to defend our sovereign rights by building strong partnerships with key players in the region, which will help us solidify our lawful rights. As we take a closer look at United States involvement in Eastern Mediterranean, we remark, dear friends, an interesting change. Not long ago, perhaps only months earlier, US involvement was meaningful, but not direct, creating a cohabitation environment with the European Union. The subject of energy comes and goes in the American agenda, depending on the country. Greece emerges as a major source of energy security, along with Israel and Cyprus. Turkey does not. This is why Turkey's overt aggressiveness inevitably swept along both the executive and the Congress of the United States. We now see the administration becoming more and more vocal because assaults cannot be left unanswered, especially when this attitude makes NATO's southern flag vulnerable. As elections approach, and you know that very well, dear Lou, as elections approach for this country, it feels like the world is on pause. Turkey, I'm afraid, will attempt to take advantage of that and even more pressure is going to be exercised on Greece and Cyprus. Our first reaction could be to storm the place. But now it's not the time for muscle power, dear friends. It is time for brain power. Greece is totally capable of exercising both, but the game must be played the smart way, not the macho way. And closing and returning to today's topic, I would say that the theater in, of the Mediterranean in World War II is very instructive for two reasons. One is for the tactical moves deployed in seizing power. The second reason is because it, because it taught us that allied powers might have won, but it was a victory at great cost. This happened because although the mission was indeed accomplished, and the status quo did not change in the Mediterranean, the effort to fight expansion was so tremendous that eventually put the tombstone, the tombstone on the traditional power of that era. Therefore, before we act, we must think, can we be smart enough to get the cheese without setting off the aggressor's trap? The answer is yes, dear friends, and our government proves it daily. Thank you very much, and congratulations again for this wonderful initiative. Thank you, thank you, quite frankly, uh, for that very enjoyable, I, I loved it actually, and uh, that analysis is absolutely correct. It's not about muscle power, it's about, it's about the brain power, and we certainly have it, and uh, thank you again. Costa, if you can, just uh, uh, sing us one more, do us the honor of singing us one more Vembo song, and then we'll get on with the panel. Got it, Lou. Thank you. Glendi efun polis ke horia, apti rumeli osto moria, pidune ke horevun don beni to toroidevun, ostratos mas panos tabuna. Ya ti lefteria mas xagripna, me toplo ya floyera tragudai nichtamera, 
Πατρίδα, πατρίδα, Ελλάδα δοξασμένη, κανείς δεν θα σ' αγγίξει τη γη τη τιμημένη. Πατρίδα, πατρίδα, όλα τα παιδιά σου στα σύνορα πεθαίνουν για την ελευθερία σου. Καλύτερα μια ώρας ελεύθερη ζωή παρά σαράντα χρόνια σκλαβιά και φυλακή. Νύφη ντυμένη άστρο λαμπερό, με τον σωλιά της πλάι για γαμπρό. Γελάει ευτυχισμένη η Ελλάδα, η δοξασμένη. Δόξα με την νίκη θέν αρθούν, στην αγκαλιά της να αποκοιμηθούν. Αφ' όλα τα παιδιά της γλυκο τραγουδούν μπροστά της. Πατρίδα, πατρίδα, Ελλάδα δοξασμένη, κανείς δεν τα σ' αγγίξει τη γη τη τιμημένη. Πατρίδα, πατρίδα, όλα τα παιδιά σου σ' αστήν ώρα πεθαίνουν για την ελευθερία σου. Καλύτερα μια ώρας ελεύθερη ζωή παρά σαράντα χρόνια σκλαβιά και φυλακή. Καλύτερα μια ώρα ελεύθερη ζωή παρά σαράντα χρόνια σκλάβια και φυλακή. Costa, thank you again for that. It was it was it was uh, fantastic. Uh, what we're going to do now is start the panel discussion. Uh, I'm going to introduce the uh, panels uh, panelists one by one. I will ask the one question. And then we'll do a, a group session of uh, various uh, questions. I will start with Lieutenant General uh, uh, retired uh, Ioannis Badzois. Uh, uh, he's, uh, he has served in all the posts provided in every rank in commanding and staff positions in Alas and abroad until his retirement. He is the president of Helis, the Hellenic Institute for Strategic Studies and a geopolitical, geostrategical analyst. He is a graduate of the uh, Military College of War, uh, the Hellenic uh, def uh, National Defense College, and the Tactical uh, Intelligence School of the US Army. He holds a master's degree from the Kapodistrian and National University of Athens in geopolitical analysis, and a degree in defense and international security from the University of Athens. He is the author of more than 500 articles and, and two books. Welcome, Yanni, and thank you for uh, for joining us today. If you can, just unmute yourself. <laughs> just unmute yourself. Uh, yeah. uh, thank hello. Thank, thank you, you very Yanni. much for the invitation. It's it's a great honor to me. It's the first time I'm participated, and uh, until now I enjoyed it very much. So uh, thank, thank you, Yanni. So let me let me ask you the first question. And again, I'm going to ask one question of each panelist and then we'll come back. So if you can, if you can uh, lay out the table for us in terms of the of the events and in terms of the two countries and uh, and how they were how they were uh, strategically packed in terms of this particular uh, war. Well, to tell the truth, I had prepared uh, 13 pages of, of speech, but I'm not use it. Uh, anyhow, Don't worry about the pitch. Yeah. yes, I, I tell you, I tell you, uh, it's very important this because I have some, I have written this one page, some study assertions about about the war in, in Epirus. Let me re read all of them and you understand why we won and why they lost the war. So okay. the select the selection. Defend the, the selected defensive location by the Hellenic general staff, Elea Kalama, was completely successful. That means the plans of our general staff. The Italian operation plan against Greece as a strategic conception was masterful. It was arch aristotechnic. But uh, in, the, in, this, in, in its implementation, however, it failed due to errors and omissions of their military leadership. General Adonio Prasca was replaced after that. The main mistake of the Italian military leadership was its over-optimism and at the same time, the underestimation 
of the opponent as well as the real capabilities of the Greek army. So, so they made the following disast disastrous mistakes. They attacked on the eve of the winter season, resulting in reduced efficiency of both the Air Force and the tanks they had. And we did have. It did not employ the main effort in Epirus with similar forces allocated, allocated only five of the 10 divisions they had. So it was good for us. The Italian forces had the, uh, no, okay, 10 infantry divisions, one armored division, one cavalry division, four Versailles regiment, and eight Albanian battalions. I'm, I'm, I'm telling all of this because we have to know, you know, we have a problem with uh, Albania, that Albanians, uh, we have uh, a, 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 a war relation, let's say. But from this, from these uh, historical uh, improvements, appro uh, the Albanian attacked first in Greece. So they don't have the right to say stop the, uh, the, uh, the war status because they started first with the Italians. Also, the Italian leadership and these troops were taken by surprise by the astonishing resistance of the Greek forces, as they believed, and the, clim the climate of optimism the, that helped everyone was that it was healthy, a healthy world. They believed that it was a healthy world, and in two or three weeks, they would be in Athens. Uh, so, a catastrophic mistake also of the Italian admi administration was the rigidity and flexibility of the military plan. In, contract, in contrast to the Greek military plans, which were flexible and adaptable to the requirements, the requirements of the operation and were implemented with great success. So, strategically, we, uh, we were better than the Italians. I tell you an example. They insisted to the main attack in the axis Kalpaki Ioannina, and uh, they did succeed. The other two directions were successfully, and they didn't change the main direction to go from the seaside uh, axis. They insisted to the main axis Elea Kalama Ioannina, and they defeated. Uh, and finally, I tell you something that is very important because maybe uh, the songs of uh, Sofia Vembo uh, gave us uh, a false idea about what happened and especially about the Italians. They mean that the Italians did not fight bravely and that is why the Greek army defeated them must be dispelled. On the contrary, the Italian and the Greek soldiers fought bravely, gave First battles, like the Battle of the Hill 731, uh, that, it is, that it is the modern Thermopylae. I tell you something, at this battle, at this battle, uh, for one week, in front of Mussolini, this, this hill was uh, kept by a Greek battalion. Uh, you know, uh, it was 731 meters. After then, the, the bombing, the hill now is 726. That means five, me five meters, it became five meters lower than previously. Can you imagine? It was one of the heaviest uh, selling in the World War II. So this is the reason. Uh, I can tell you, uh, Lou, generally that they, uh, they are very optimistic. They wanted that they have, let's say, a walk. And we saw in the beginning to, to go to Kalpaki Elea, the, the front line of Greece, like a parade. They didn't think that the, the Greeks would resist about this. On the other hand, all the uh, military plans of our uh, military leaders were excellent. And they have uh, the ability to change them. So, optimistic bravely from the cells, uh, from our, ta uh, our side and the ability to change our plans. So this is the reason.
Thank you. Thank you so much. And then you are absolutely correct. In the beginning, they were pushing into uh, into into Epirus, into Greek Epirus. And then after a few weeks, they were pushed back, quite frankly, into southern Albania or what we call Vorio Epirus. And uh, quite frankly, the world was absolutely shocked. The world was absolutely shocked at what was taking place in Europe, because, as we said, nation after nation after nation fell rapidly. No one expected the resistance that took place in northern Greece. Thank you so much. And we'll come back, obviously, uh, to you, uh, Lieutenant General. Uh, Professor Kitroff's uh, research and uh, publishing focuses on nationalism and ethnicity in modern Greece and its diaspora and its manifestation across a broad spectrum from politics to sports. Uh, he has written uh, a number of books. I don't want to go through the books, but I'll mention some of them. The recent book that came out has to do with the uh, Greek Orthodox Church in America, A Modern History. The book before that, excellent book, uh, Alexander, The uh, Greeks and the Making of Modern Egypt, uh, Cairo. Uh, and uh, Elas, Evropi, Panathea Anakos, which is very interesting. <laughs> so we're, go we're going from, uh, from Greeks to uh, the sports, wrestling with the ancients, uh, modern identity in the Greek Olympics. Gregos and America, which I think is great, uh, because obviously the alienists were in uh, in America, and the Egypt, of course, uh, the Greeks in Egypt. Uh, he has uh, worked on many projects, uh, and right now he's working on a, on a book on the history of uh, the hundredth anniversary of Ahepa, uh, which will take place in uh, 2022, and also the uh, the history of Greek Americans and diner restaurants. Uh, he continues his collaboration with Maria Iliou, for example, on some of the movies that many of us uh, have uh, watched. Uh, they include, of course, um, Smyrna, 1922, The Destruction of a Cosmopolitan City, uh, From Both Sides of the Aegean, Expulsions and uh, Population Exchange, Greece, uh, Turkey, 1922, 1924. And he's currently working uh, on, uh, on a series of, uh, of documentaries, I guess, relating to Athens from the Hellenic Revolution uh, in, into the uh, late 19th century. Uh, he was also a professor of my son uh, who, who attended Haverford a few years ago and who he, he himself is a professor now of law. Uh, thank you, Alexander, and thank you for uh, coming today and giving us the honor of being with us. Alexander, we said we would ask one question uh, in the beginning, so I'll ask uh, one question of you. Explain to us uh, Elas Ochide and its impact on America. Uh, thank you, Lou. Thanks for the invitation. And it's a, a great pleasure to be here with uh, on this panel with, uh, uh, I, I will say, old and, and new friends who I respect uh, greatly. So. Um, October 28 was a turning point for Greece. It was also a huge turning point for the Greeks in America for two reasons. First of all, it signaled the acceptance of the Greeks by the Americans. And the second reason was that the Greeks renewed their close relationship with their homeland. As far as the first uh, element of this equation is concerned, the, uh, as we know, uh, for the first half of the 20th century, there was a huge influx of immigrants from Southeastern Europe, including Greeks, who were not always welcome uh, by the uh, people who were here already in the United States. They faced on one extreme racist attacks from the Ku Klux Klan, and on a milder scale, uh, discrimination, uh, difficulty of finding uh, employment. Many of them changed their names because of that. It's a story well known. And that is the reason, of course, that AHEPA was founded in 1922 to spearhead the Americanization of the Greeks and encourage the Greeks to Americanize. And they were very successful in the 1920s. And the truth is that the nativist hostility was ebbing in the 1930s. The immigrants were becoming more and more accepted. And when America started fighting against the Nazis, who were of course the prototypes of racist discrimination, uh, attitudes towards the immigrants changed, but especially changed with the Greeks when the American press reported the heroic 
response of Greece um, in the face of the Italian attacks. The New York Times spoke of the Greeks creating a new Salamis and a new Thermopylae the day after the attack when the Orchi was became known uh, in, uh, uh, in the United States. There was huge admiration for Greece and the United States and many, many Greeks enlisted in the US Army and fought on the side of the, uh, fought as part of the American forces during World War II after Pearl Harbor. Uh, we, we, don't, we, we still don't have the exact numbers. It's something that interests me. We want to quantify that. Secondly, the relationship with Greece, and I'll, I'll sum it up so that I don't take too much time. The relationship with Greece was spectacular. It had to do with raising funds to offer relief to the Greeks during the time that they were resisting the Axis attack from October 1940 right through May 1941. There were thousands of dollars of uh, equipment, of medical supplies, money to build bomb shelters, uh, uh, sending, uh, creating ambulances, sending them over. There was great support during those six months. And after that, uh, during Greece's period of occupation, there were 101 vessels with supplies that were sent with money raised in the United States on the part, uh, on the part of the Greek Americans. The organization, some spirit, uh, organizing all this was called the Greek, the GRWA, the Greek Relief War Association. Um, it was headed by Spiros Skouras, the 20th century Fox, uh, Fox executive. And I have a member, and I have a member. And I have a member. And an Archdiocese member, the Archdiocese will <laughs> yes. tell you. <laughs> and um, uh, William Hellis and others. And the local Ahepa chapters and the local parishes, of course, did the work. The, the, the organization was, was, was coordinating. It was Ahepa and the church that did all that work. Just two more things to mention. Uh, was the, uh, the, the support of raising money for the American government, the bonds, the government bonds that were being sold. Uh, the Greek Americans were very active in selling war bonds, which was essentially lending money to the American government among themselves, but also the Greek Americans were selling bonds to other Americans and the HEPA, in fact, was allowed by the uh, US government to become an official agency of the war bonds. So war bonds of the Greek American, war bonds raised among the Greek Americans and war bonds that the Greek Americans raised uh, with interactions with other Americans completes a picture of uh, an entire Greek American community mobilizing on the side of America and the side of Greece beginning uh, in Octo um, from October 28, 1940. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexander. I mean, one of the interesting things with regards to Skouras and uh, what, what he did and other AHEPA members was that they couldn't, they couldn't send supplies directly from the United States. So what they, what they did basically is they used Turkey, uh, which, was, which was a neutral nation at the time and basically had ships loaded from Turkey actually going to Greece uh, to avoid being bombed, quite frankly. So it's, it's, a, fascinating, it's a fascinating history. Thank you, thank you again. Um, uh, Marsha Haddad the Konomoropoulos has served as the uh, museum director of Kehila Kadosha Yanina and sits on the board of trustees of the synagogue and museum. She is also on the board of directors of the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative and has been president of the Association of Friends of Greek Jewelry since its foundation and working for the American Jewish Committee on the Cyprus team. She was born into a traditional Sephardic Jewish family from Salonika and has devoted her life to telling the story of Greek Jewry as an author, translator, editor, and lecturer. She holds multiple degrees, uh, one uh, from uh, the BAs, let's say from uh, Queens College in Psychology, 
and one from Queens College in, in Byzantine and Modern Greek Studies, and has uh, master's degrees in uh, psychiatric casework for the New School, and a degree, a master's degree in Italian from uh, uh, Queens College. She was honored by the Jewish community of Yanina for her multifaceted continuous work in support of the Jewish community of Yanina and the Jewish communities of Greece. Welcome, Marcia, and thank you for being with us. Thank you. The first question to you is, is Marcia, uh, tell us about the, the, uh, the Hellenes, the alienists of the Jewish faith at the time and those who fought for their nation? Okay, the, the numbers. In a Jewish population at the time in 1940 of approximately 76,000, there were over 13,000 Greek Jews that fought on the Albanian front, disproportionate to their number in the population. This was a very personal war. They had heard what was going on in Germany, they uh, heard what was going on like on the island of Rhodes with Italy. This was very personal. Of those, there were 3,500 who returned with severe injuries, many of them amputees from frostbite on the Albanian front, and 513 that gave their lives for Greece. Uh, many know the story of Colonel Mordecai Frazis, who's a hero, national hero in Greece, and we are very proud of him. He was a Greek Jew from Kalkis, uh, left behind when he, uh, when he died in December of 1940, leading his charge on horseback. That was, uh, in fact, there's an equestrian statue in Kalkis at his honor that was sponsored by a Greek diner owner outside of Detroit, which was very interesting, Stephanos Bakarius, and we helped him with the fundraising on that. Um, we know his story and we're very proud of it. But I'd like to talk the names of those that are not often mentioned. Uh, young Jewish men from Yanina who gave their lives to fight for their country. You know, when you're, when you're dealing with such a small community, it, it's easy to look up the facts. I'm sure many of you from personal uh, family history know the names of your relatives that perished. Um, Joseph Raphael would be the first casualty from Jan, and he was 26 years old. He sold vegetables with his father, Angelos. Joseph would die on November 5th, 1940, only a week into the war. Tragedy came early to the small Jewish community of Ioannina. 21 days later, Ioannina would lose another son. Moses Shemos was 24 when he died on November 26th, 1940. His mother was a widow. Her other sons had gone to Athens to make a living. Moses was her sole support. The toll would continue and on January 11th, 1941, the small Jewish community of Yanina, then numbering about 2000, would be one less. Shemos Atis was 31 when he died of injuries on the Albanian front. He was the middle son of Elias and along with his brothers, Nisim and David, helped his father in a small textile shop. In February, another Yanozi would be lost. David Negrin was 28 when he died on February 14, 1941. He and his family were dairymen. The son of the butcher, Pizzarillo, Judah was 25 when he fell in battle. And the remains of Olio Negrin, son of Solomon the merchant, has never been found. He has been listed as missing in action since November of 1940. One of the saddest stories is that of Nisim Addis, severely injured at the age of 24. He would return to Iran as an amputee. Along with his widowed mother, Anita, his older brother, Joseph, Joseph's wife, Esther, and his younger brother, Moses, he would be deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau. There were, directly to the gas chambers, there was a, a photograph of prosthesis of Greek Jewish veterans that were taken to Auschwitz-Birkenau. And of course, would go straight to the gas chambers because they were not considered capable of working inside the camps. This is a very painful subject for us. Um, 
In addition to the losses, there are many who feel that these veterans who fought on the Albanian front and sacrificed so much should have been protected from deportation. Unfortunately, that did not happen. I'm proud to say the two members of my own family, Herrera, Moise Herrera from Salonika. There were so, so many Salonikis that fought on the Albanian front that there were battalions that were called the Cohen battalions because they were filled with Jews. And Moise came back. Uh, he had gotten a taste of battle. He wasn't going to go and be taken by the Germans with the roundups. He attempted escape with four other young men. They were all publicly hung in front of their mothers to really accentuate the pain. He's buried in the new cemetery in Salonika, which gives me the opportunity to lay a stone for my family because it's the only remains that we have in Greece. Another man by the name of Alberto Herrera, which also became a hero. He was one of the first Greek Jews to escape, one of the only Greek Jews to escape from Auschwitz-Birkenau, although he was caught and executed. He uh, fought on the Albanian front, and like Moise, there was the feeling of power. They had fought, they had conquered, they had won, they had diminished the, the Italians. He wasn't going to be passive. He was rounded up, he was in the concentration camp, he was instrumental in the blow up, the revolt of the Santa Commando in the fall of 1944. Okay. Um, I wanna thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk personally about this. Um, very often our story is not fully covered and we're very proud of our participation. Our community at Broome Street, and by the way, Greek Jews fought for the United States government um, also probably disproportionately to their numbers in the general population. There was one young man by the name of um, Nisim Adas who was deemed the shortest man to ever enlist in the United States Armed Forces in World War II and found his first physical. His friend Maxine Negrin said to him, stand on your tippy toes, he passed and unfortunately died at the Battle of the Bulge. But these were very personal stories. And what many people don't understand about our community in Kehela Kedosha Yanada in, in New York, we're so proud to be Greek. We define ourselves as Greek Americans, Hellenes. Uh, we are American by nationality, Jewish by religion, and Greek by ethnicity. Thank you. Marsha, thank you, thank you so much. Th Marsha, thank you so much. There's a, there seems to be a reverberation. Hold on a second. Marsha, thank you so much for that. Um, certainly, certainly you are Hellenes. There's no, there's no doubt about it. And it was demonstrated uh, throughout history, as you know. Uh, the uh, Hellenes of the uh, Jewish faith have been in Greece from uh, 1000 BC, quite frankly. <laughs> And uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of that is outlined. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, in, in Catherine Fleming's book, mm -hmm. uh, which she calls uh, "Greece: A Jewish History." So I recommend that book certainly for those uh, who are interested in the topic. Uh, th thank you again, and we'll come back obviously uh, in the further questioning. Uh, Jimmy Kokotas is the uh, supreme vice president of AHEPA which is the largest and oldest uh, grassroots uh, association of, 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 of American citizens of Hellenic uh, heritage and Phil Hellenes with more than 400 chapters across uh, the United States, uh, Canada and Europe. Uh, their mission, our mission is to promote the ancient Hellenic ideals of education, philanthropy, civil responsibility, family and individual excellence through community service and volunteerism. Jimmy is an entrepreneur, philanthropist, and owner of the famous and iconic Tom's Restaurants. He is a graduate of Brooklyn Tech and Brooklyn College. Uh, Jimmy, welcome. Thank you for being here with us uh, today. My pleasure, Brother Lou, my pleasure. The question to you, Jimmy, is, uh, is uh, quite frankly, there's so many questions because I have actually has been involved in so many things relating to what the topic we're talking about. But just if you can uh, further elaborate on the war bond issue that was discussed by uh, Professor Kitroff, by Alexander, when he was talking about the war bonds. 
Uh, HEPA's role in that was, was not only just a normal road, it was an unbelievable road. Can you, can you just go briefly into that? Yes, Brother Lou. Uh, what we're really known for when it comes to speaking of World War II was that war bond effort, $350 million approximately. Uh, I think it almost represented about close to 10% of, uh, of the total cost of the war uh, was, was raised, of the war bonds was raised by a HEPA. I think the whole war cost them about three and a half to four billion dollars. So AHEPA was the only fraternal organization that was duly registered as an agent of the United States Treasury Department. No other civic organization was granted that honor. Uh, and this was, again, we're a grassroots organization, chapters, individuals, uh, a member who used to sell peanuts in the front of the, uh, in the, front of the Capitol, uh, I think was, 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 was sold the war bond to uh, Sam Rayburn. Who the, who the building is named after down in Washington, D.C. Um, besides the war bonds, the Greek war relief with the, with the, with the Skouras brothers, Ahepa was involved with that. But I wanna just touch on what uh, our Council General of New York pointed out, that fighting intelligently. I'll get, throw a couple of things out there that most people do not know. Uh, our past Supreme President, George Vornas, Major George Vornas, who was good friends with FDR, a uh, member of the Delphi chapter, Yes. Uh, Major Vornas became president, I think, in 42, but he was president, was friends with President uh, FDR. Uh, and he met with them, spoke with them, and uh, they, they generated a lot of support from the American side uh, and relief towards Greece. Uh, uh, and that, again, working behind the scenes, working intelligently uh, and using uh, resources and, and, and friends and associates that you had, and obviously FDR being a member of the organization and, and knowing what we were about, uh, somebody approaching him and asking him for some sort of help towards the country was much easier uh, when you're dealing with friends. Um, besides the, the, the war bonds, the Greek battalion of the OSS, the Greek battalion of the OSS at the time, uh, with the help of our sons of Pericles, our junior order, which was founded in 1926, which is our young men, uh, 18 to 25, 26 at the time, which were people that were being uh, in, in, enlisted or drafted to go to go fight, uh, both in Greece and over here, depending how you look at it and what they were, you know, which which country they were in. Um, the uh, HEPA constitution was used as a cipher between the OSS. So you had Greeks over there that were Hepans that knew the, the foundational principles of the constitution, and they were they were using the, the constitution, the HEPA constitution, as a cipher to communicate. Um, and then even beyond that, the Truman Doctrine was, I believe, signed in 1947. Uh, well, President Truman became a member of HEPA in 1946, uh, a year before the Truman Doctrine. So again, using uh, an association, a friendship uh, to help persuade, help get somebody to listen to the, uh, to, 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 the, to the deaf ears where you would normally fall upon with, when there is no friendship and, and no uh, water under the bridge. Uh, it really helped that Ahepa was out there in this prominent role with, with, with. Uh, did we lose Jimmy? Jimmy, are you there? Uh, we may have lost Jimmy. Uh, can, can everybody hear me, by the way? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, while we're waiting for Jimmy, let me just, uh, let me just, uh, if you didn't hear some of the stuff he said, let me further elaborate on what Jimmy was talking about. Lou, it, oh, Lou you're I'm sorry. Off. Oh yeah, go ahead. We got cut off. I'm sorry. Um, so, so again, it's it's. I want to touch upon what what the what the council general said, Dr. Kutras. Greece was 100 only 120 years into their own liberation of almost 400 years under under Turkish rule, and the passion of these people their faith in doing what's right. And, and if you think about it, the, the young men and women who died in, the, in their forties and part of the whole, the, the whole uh, resistance, they probably, with, the, with the, the children that heard the stories of their grandparents, who heard the stories from their grandparents of when they were able to liberate from Turkey. So to know and to have that purpose and meaning in this organization for promoting those values, for keeping the, trying to keep the history alive. Values and principles should not change. They should stand the test of time. What's right is right will always be right. And what's wrong and what's bad will always be bad and wrong. 
And that is what we, what we must remember. When Greece decided to fight for themselves and said, Oshi, and, you know, the, then it will be war. In the back of their minds, they had to have known that they couldn't win the war. But they knew in their hearts and souls that they had to fight it because that was the right thing to do. So whatever would have happened was okay. But their honor and, 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 and the fight that they had within them ended up changing the world. Today, we see what's going on in Greece with Turkey and with, with, with so much wrong being done. And you have so many other countries, much more powerful today than Greece was in 1940, yet a lot of them lack the backbone and the courage to stand behind Greece and say, you know, Turkey is wrong because too many people are busy playing political games. If everybody just played political games and thought about themselves, Greece would have said, Italy, come in. We don't want our country decimated and ruined going into war. Italy would have walked in, the, 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 the axes of evil would have moved forward and the world would not be what it is today. So I'm proud to say that Ahepa now, almost 100 years later, still just continues to promote those same ideals and values of the civic responsibility, like you said, uh, individual and, and family excellence. And to know that we as Greeks still have that passion inside of us is what we need to get through to our children and our grandchildren. Because if you're not going to have a passion about your history, your culture, your people in the world, then and God, of course, then you're kind of going through the world soulless. We're all we're all here for something for something greater than just going to work every day and, and paying bills. And again, I would hope that people are keeping track of what's going on, because if you go back before 1974 and you looked at what was going on in the world, nobody would have ever guessed Cyprus would have been invaded. And now we see what's going on in Greece. And you see, you've got somebody in Turkey who's really, whether doing it for political reasons to, 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 to stir up his own people or whatever, because he's not that popular within his country and a bunch of problems that they have. But it's our responsibility to remind people of what's happening. And I thank you for the lectures that you've done because you keep bringing these things to people's attention. There's so many people that don't know history. Uh, and even if you don't know it precisely, to at least get a greater idea of the, of the big picture of what's happened and, and, and what exists out there. And for the professor, for Dr. Kutas and everybody else on the panel, I applaud them and thank them for, what, for the job they've done. I'm not a historian. I'm, again, I'm just proud of this organization for what it's done to keep promoting the history, to keep promoting the ideals and values so that the younger generations are taught them correctly in the prop, proper perspective because we see so many uh, little glimpses of history continuously get rewritten where we forget what's happened to the Armenians and we forget what's happened to the Jews and we forget what's happened to the Greeks and the further away we move away from it and Papu hasn't given the history to the grandchildren, uh, the grandchildren grow up not having a, a point of, 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 of retrospect as to what really did happen. So I thank you and I commend you and everybody else in the panel uh, for the good work that you're doing, enlightening people and keeping these memories in their minds. Jimmy, Jimmy, thank you. Thank you for all that. And thank you for mentioning Cyprus, because, uh, you know, for those who don't know, uh, when it was when war was declared, there were thousands, thousands who left Cyprus to fight in Greece and thousands of uh, now that Alexander's here also thousands of, 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 of Hellenes in Egypt, thousands left Egypt and went uh, and went to Greece uh, to fight. And not only that, in terms of, uh, of Americans, uh, for those who don't know, and you, and you spoke about it, in, uh, in 1943, President Franklin uh, Delano Roosevelt, an initiated member of uh, HEPA, uh, chapter number 25, which is my chapter that I was also the past president of, signed an executive order establishing the US Army 122 Infantry Battalion. And the reason why it was, uh, it was, uh, it was asked for uh, from Greece, uh, obviously, and they deployed this battalion in Greece. The reason why they named it the 120, uh, 122 Infantry Battalion it was because it was 122 years after Greek independence from the Ottoman, uh, from the Ottoman Empire. He appointed, the president appointed Major, uh, Major uh, Peter Klanos of Manchester, New Hampshire, as commanding officer of the 122nd Infantry Battalion, he was the first Hellenic American to graduate from West Point. Uh, he was born in Sparta, where, where I was born, so you know that makes me feel good. 
And, uh, and he arrived in the United States as a, a small child. But that battalion went into, went into Greece and quite frankly, they were, they were embedded uh, during the occupation. Uh, many of them were spies, there were, there were OSS agents actually. And there's a whole history that we cannot go into at this particular time, but it's an important history of what took place. You are correct that the, uh, that the HEPA Supreme President at the time was George uh, Vurnas, and he recruited members of, of these various operational groups uh, you know, for, the, for this particular battalion. Thank you again, uh, Jimmy. Peter uh, Yakumis is a historian and author of the recently released book, The Forgotten Heroes of the Balkan Wars, Greek Americans and Philhellenes, uh, 1912 to 1913. He is a historical consultant and researcher of Greek military history. His main focus is on Greek Americans of the early 20th century. He has served as a reserve captain in the Army Division, a New York Guard for six years, and he is the Vice President of Byzantine Crown Productions. He holds a master's degree in international relations and has authored various online works, including Greek American Pioneers and Phil Hellenes of the Balkan Wars and the Pioneer Greek Americans. Thank you for being with us, Peter, today. Peter, Metaxat, you know, uh, you wrote this book recently on the Balkan Wars. Tell us a little, a little bit about Metaxa and his background in particular as it relates to those Balkan Wars. Well, Lou, thanks for having me on board here. Uh, I'm honored to be in the presence of all these esteemed colleagues and, and uh, fellow uh, panelists. Um, just very quickly, Ohi Day is very special to me, Lou, because my grandfather and his brother fought on the Albanian front lines from the beginning to the end. They even encountered the Germans. So I've grown up with all the stories. Uh, I interviewed my grandfather, and this is near and dear to me. So thank you for having me. Uh, in terms of uh, Metaxas, Lou, uh, in my research, uh, I spent quite a, quite a bit of time, seven and a half years writing my book. Uh, it was interesting that I, I ran into uh, Metaxas uh, several times. He had served um, as the assistant chief of staff for the general headquarters as a captain. Now, obviously, he had, uh, he had a uh, very interesting background in terms of uh, graduating from the German military academy. And uh, although he was a captain, um, he was uh, well respected and you know placed into these high positions. So he had a, a, a good take on bigger pictures. And he also participated in some very, very important uh, uh, decision making processes as a uh, member of uh, the, the staff, as a staff officer. Uh, in particular, uh, I'd like to just point out that uh, he, uh, he negotiated the uh, surrender of Thessaloniki on 26 October 1912. And he contributed his expertise to the capture of Ioannina and was one of the officers signing the surrender protocol of the Turks in Ioannina after the famous Battle of Bizani, which I thought was also fascinating. And, you know, that was, uh, and there were other things that he participated in in 1912 in the first war. And then in uh, 1913, he was also, you know, uh, instrumental as a staff officer and he quickly rose through the ranks. But um, in terms of a, a overall viewpoint that he had being as a, a staff officer on that level, that gave him insights that others just didn't have. So I, I thought that was very fascinating in and of itself. Tell, tell us just what, you know, for the, the audience that doesn't know really, uh, how many people actually, uh, Hellenic Americans, left the United States to fight in the Balkan Wars? Uh, according, to, uh, according to the king, 45,000. So that's about a third of the Hellenic deployed army of 1912 were made up of uh, Greek Americans. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to open up the discussion a little bit now, but I'm, I'm going to start again with Lieutenant uh, uh, General uh, Yanis. Uh, uh, Lou, uh, let me let me before make your question. Let me let me say something that uh, uh, I think it's very important. Uh, Operation Barbarossa. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. I, I know, that, but uh, but it was the great contribution of Greece uh, for the end of the war. The, you know, it delayed the Operation Barbarossa. But first of all, I would yes. like to to mention that uh, one of the heroes, uh, officers of the Albanian front, 
was a lieutenant colonel Mordechai Frizis. Mordechai Frizis is a, a Greek Jewish who participated in all over the walls of Greece in the in the tents uh, from 1912 uh, until uh, the 1914 the, in the in, in the war in the Epirus. So he participated in the Balkan Wars. He of participated course. in the First World War in the Macedonian Front. He participated in the Crimea War when Greece sent two divisions over there, Greek mistake. We paid it in Asia uh, destruction. And he was, of course, in the, uh, in the Asia Minor, and he was a commander of a regiment in, uh, in, in, front of the, uh, in the front of Epirus. And he killed him. I remember 9th of December, something like maybe 8th or 9th of December, 1940. 11th of December. 11, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I lost two days. So, uh, fighting uh, in front of his regiment, giving, you know, uh, the example for his soldiers. So, that's why I wanted to mention uh, Mordechai for this in order to show that all the Greek, uh, Greek Jewish, etc., etc., participate to this battle. And something else before go to Barbarossa operation that uh, you know uh, it is as I said the great contribution of Greece in ending this war because we delayed the operation Barbarossa. They lost. Before we get into Barbarossa, we're going to talk about it in one second. Yes. The other thing that people should realize is that it didn't happen in a snap. We have October 28th, you know, Grassi came and spoke to Metaxas and the war started. The reality is prior to that time period, there was a lot of issues that were taking place in the Eastern Mediterranean, including bombing Hellenic ships. I'm talking about the, uh, the fascist Ellie. forces right now. And, and Metaxas knew what was going on because he saw a buildup in Albania. Albania at the time was obviously a protectorate of, uh, of Italy, and uh, the forces were, uh, were getting there. Within Italy, there was propaganda on a continual basis of invasion and going into Greece. It wasn't something that all of a sudden came up and the Greeks went to war. When they declared the war, there were celebrations in Athens. There were celebrations in Athens. People were enthusiastic because they were tired of the propaganda. They were tired of the nonsense that was taking place. And everyone, all Hellenes, all Hellenes of every persuasion were quite frankly ready to fight. They, and as the Metaxas said, and I have the, I won't read the whole thing, the proclamation of the, uh, of the prime minister, but he basically said, it is now for us to show whether we are indeed worthy of our ancestors and of the freedom won for us by our forefathers. Let the entire nation rise as one man. Fight for your country, your wives, your children, and our sacred traditions. The struggle for all has begun. Nin iper panton agon. Now, with that, let's go to Operation Barbarossa. Sorry for cutting you off. <laughs> Operation Barbarossa was obviously an extremely important event in world history. If you can start off, and anybody who wants to jump into the conversation, please do. Uh, yes, but uh, let me let me tell something because I want to to, to mention this uh, because because it is it is very very important for me to mention this. I have please. yes. Uh, listen, uh, in enough, to, you know, before the twenty eighth of October. We have to remember that until the summer of 1940, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Norway, Denmark, Belgium, Netherlands, France have occupied also, uh, uh, also, uh, uh, I'll tell you the days, France uh, resisted for 45 days, Belgium 18 days, Netherlands five days only, uh, Denmark occupied 
in 12 hours, in 12 hours, half a day. And Greece resisted for 216 days from Epiros to the Crete Island. So this caused, this caused uh, the, a delay for uh, the Operation Barbarossa. If, I, I, I think everybody knows about this, it was the operation of uh, Nazi uh, against Russia. Before the operation Barbarossa, he made the operation Marita that came to Greece in order to, uh, because due to this, to this resistance and uh, uh, Hitler uh, looking that his partner uh, was defeated, he tried to make this operation Marita. With Operation Marita, who finished at, uh, at the half of June, caused the Operation uh, Barbarossa because Operation Barbarossa, you know, the two operations were uh, connected. And some troops from Marita had to go to the Operation Barbarossa. So instead of 5th, 5th of May, they, they started the Operation Barbarossa in 22 of June. These six weeks was catas were catastrophic for this operation because the Germans had uh, planned this operation to be finished in 10 or 12 weeks. That means three months at least, uh, uh, at the maximum. And after this one and a half month, they, they, uh, you know, the waiter came and the general waiter in Russia, Stepas, etc., won the German army. So the biggest contribution uh, in the World War II was uh, the contribution of Greece who delays the Operation Barbarossa. And after that, not only this, we saved many lives because the war finished after three years. And also, also uh, uh, we let the British to come and to control the Mediterranean Sea to control North Africa, etc., etc. So, uh, Operation Barbarossa was recognized as also by Hitler himself, who said that uh, we lost the war uh, because uh, Mussolini started uh, the attack against Greece, and we lost the days for Barbarossa. So, this is the real truth. And we have to be very proud about this because, uh, okay, it's not uh, how to say uh, very big, but uh, the biggest contribution in the war was the contribution of Greece in the first year, the first two years of the war. No, absolutely. I mean, there's no, there's no doubt about it that the, that the war would have been completely different if, in fact, if in fact the Nazi forces under Operation uh, Barbarossa attacked the Soviet Union earlier. One of the things that concerned obviously the Nazi forces was the fact that they didn't, they thought that they may lose the oil fields of Romania at the time. So they really had to head south because they were afraid that the Greeks would overrun everybody, go into, go into, uh, in, into, the, into the north and things of that na nature. And when we talk about, for example, Metaxa, don't forget Metaxa set up the famous Metaxa line which was uh, in, uh, towards Bulgaria. He did, they didn't know in the beginning which way, which way the forces would come. They didn't, uh, they didn't realize until later, obviously, that they would come through Albania. And then, and then when they had to fight a two-front war, a two-front war, which became almost impossible, uh, they had to, in a sense, give up. But even when they gave up, even when the Nazi forces came in uh, in April, when they came in in early April, and they finally raised the Nazi flag, the Nazi flag on the Acropolis, which is behind me in, uh, in late April, there was the Battle of Crete. And uh, more, more German paratroopers died there than any other part in the history of their forces. So many Nazi paratroopers were killed that Hitler never after that period ever allowed paratroopers to come into the in, into, into a warfare situation. So you're right. absolutely correct. But before that, another recognition of Greece and, and uh, Alexander, if you can jump on board too, and anybody, has to do with the Greek merchant marines. 
The Greek merchant marines, for those who don't know, prior to the war, were, were in fact the people who were bringing food and sub military supplies into Europe. And over 2,000, over 2,000 Greek merchant marines went into the sea because, because eventually they were targeted by both German ships and, and fascist ships of Italy at that particular time. And, uh, and that's a recognition that has to do also with what happened during the period of Orchidei and uh, preceding Orchidei in this particular case. And many of the ships, when finally Greece was, was taken over, many of the ships were in the ocean. And many of those ships had to dock into, into other countries. Many docked into the United States. Because again, for those who don't know, the Greek shipping companies at the time, most of the major shipping companies were based in New York and other parts of the United States. And many of the Greeks who came, merchant marines came into the United States during that period. The second they started walking across, America was there and they, and they, and they joined the American military. Would you like to uh, elaborate on that a little bit, Alexander, if you can? Yeah, no, you're, you're muted, you're muted. Unmute, yes, I would like to do that. Uh, and it's worth noting that there were very strong Siemens union at the time, radical Siemens unions, but there was part of this unity that we are talking about, because I think one of the themes that we have today is, is the fact that this was, this was a, a, a campaign that drew all Greeks of all persuasions, religious, political as well. Metaxas was a dictator, but, but, and the country was divided, but the country united after the Ochi day. Those very strong Siemens unions had this slogan, Kratite Taplia in Kinesi, keep the ships moving. And that was the ultimate, that, that let's, let's shelve our demands, whatever we have at the moment, and keep those merchant ships crossing the Atlantic in those very, very crucial convoys across the North Atlantic. And they were as you say, there was, there was uh, the basis, one of the, the Siemens unions and uh, ship owners centers was uh, New, New York, the port of New York. Cardiff in England was another port. And throughout the year, the, the contribution of the Greek merchant navy is, is a separate chapter in, in what we are talking about. And the numbers are huge. Numbers of people lost of ships gone down, but above all the supplies that made it across the Atlantic and enabled the, the, uh, the war effort to take place. So that's, that's another aspect. And, you know, it, it occurs to me, and I'm, you know, I'm sitting here on my, in my campus apartment that, you know, this story is not well known in, in America. Yeah, I was reading a book about D-Day and, and it argued that every country remembers D-Day in the way that it, it, it has to do with its own contributions. So, you know, it's understandable that maybe American textbooks don't talk about the role of Greece and, and it's up to us, Peter Yakumis. I'm glad you've got material <laughs> and I think you should follow up on this. It's up to us to publish all this conversation that we are having and, and help the Americans understand Greece's role. Can I, I come I, in? Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, Marcia. Yeah, uh, a proud graduate of Queens College Byzantine and Modern Greek program um, and a proud fan of Byzantium. It always bothers me how so much of history is not told. I mean, in the West, they don't even discuss Byzantium. I taught courses in Byzantium. People had never heard of it. They didn't know what it was. And Greek history, nothing is mentioned in American textbooks. But don't feel bad, because Jews only make the textbooks when it comes to the tragedies. So uh, there really has to be a revamping of how history is taught. I think what Alexander mentioned is, a, is extremely important because, because what we try to do also, what the, certainly our organization tries to do, is not to make the, these various events that we're talking about, whether the revolution or Orchidei, as a Greek thing. In other words, these are what happened in Greece, what the Greeks did, is of international importance, quite frankly, that affected mm -hmm. a lot of other countries. So when we're talking, for example, of the merchant marines, many people don't know, for example, 
that that uh, when they when they came out with the Liberty ships, that America actually had Greek ship owners take over Liberty ships and transport materials into Europe for America. In other words, these were these were Liberty ships that were American, that that America gave the Greek uh, shipping uh, shipping people for them to 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 ship the supplies. The first ship that they gave them was actually was actually called Liberty Elas, Liberty Elas. And that's the reason why, by the way, that when the war was over, understanding the, merchant, the Greek merchant marines and their sacrifices across the Atlantic, bringing these supplies that the United States made a special effort to give Liberty ships, to allow Greeks to buy Liberty ships at a reduced cost. The Liberty ships became the backbone, the backbone of the Hellenic shipping fleet, which is now the largest fleet in the world, in the world. So these again are things that are not, they're not basically discussed. The, uh, Marshall, but, but as, long, as long as you're, go ahead, I interrupted you, but I'm gonna ask you a question in a second. Okay, I just wanna mention something, you know, I constantly get videos of Greeks dancing to Zorba in the streets throughout all the capitals in Europe and all over the place. Why not put something out there that on, on October 28th, throughout the Hellenic diaspora, whether they're in London or Paris or wherever, they should have something among them where they commemorate Oki Day to tell the story to the communities that they're living in. The, 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 the story is being told, obviously, in Greece and in other countries. Uh, and and they, have, they have an Oki Day, uh, 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 I don't know what they call the organization, that does something in Washington. But again, again, I have to emphasize, I have to emphasize that we have to change mentally the way, the way we express these, these things that are important to us. They are not just our events. They're international events, okay? They're events that are important internationally. And what we have to get away uh, from is to talk about it on a personal level, like it's only about us. No. It's not only about us, what transpired during that particular time period, during Ochi Day, the six months, the six months that they fought, as was indicated by, by uh, the Lieutenant General Bayani, he, he, he elaborated how country fell in days, in weeks, and Greece, the Greeks, the small country, was invaded and went through a horrific, horrific occupation. And Marsha, the question is to you, basically, because you touched on it a little bit, but please discuss the occupation and the, 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 the massive destruction of the Hellenic uh, Jews, of uh, the Hellenic Jews, our people, our people that were taken away and the percentage of our people that were killed during that occupational period. Okay, Greece has the unfortunate distinction of having lost 87% of its Jewish population. Where my family came from in Thessaloniki, 97%. And Thessaloniki was, uh, of the 76,000 Jews in Greece, 56,000 resided in Thessaloniki. Um, you know, I, we try to accentuate what Greek Christians try to do to save their Jewish neighbors. And because too often we hear comments like Greeks were anti-Semitic. No, 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 there's no black and white. Yes, there were collaborators, but there were many who risked their own lives. You know, to carry on in this thing of um, Oki Day, I know a family personally, one of the members of descendants is on our board of trustees. It was the Akos family that the father was rounded up from Athens. Rosa Akos and her five children survived a Christian woman, Anula uh, Sarianu, reached out because her husband had died on the Albanian front. She knew what loss was like, and she offered sanctuary to this family so that they would not be disseminated. Her house was directly across from Gestapo Com High Command in that particular area outside of Athens. Uh, so the risk that she was taking uh, we honor, we give our award of moral courage, we submit the names to Yad Vashem, and there were, right now I think the number is 351 Greeks are uh, recognized by Yad Vashem as righteous among nations, that is a small fraction. Uh, one of my dear friends, um, Yolanda Willis, uh, Avram Willis, uh, coined the phrase, um, 
when asked how her family was saved, her family was saved on the island of Crete. She said, was it the baker that gave us a piece of bread when we were starving? Was it the policeman who looked the other way when he knew that our identification papers were suspect? Was it the man who took us in, risking the lives of his children and, his, and himself? She said, to them, it might have been nothing. To us, it was everything. And I really feel when it comes to teaching the Holocaust, Greece offered so much there because there were so many contrasts. There were no easy answers. But if we're going to pass anything on to the next generation, let them make the right choice. Uh, I think we should, forgive me if anyone is offended by this, we should raise a generation of anarchists. We should raise a generation to stop. <laughs> I don't know about well, the anarchists, Marshall. Anyway. I don't know about the anarchists. But, you know, these were we have people, too many anarchists right now. If you look at a common factor among those that risked their lives, no matter what country they were in, did they know the people? Not necessarily. Were they religious? Not necessary. The one thing was they didn't follow along with what everybody else was doing. Uh, to them, um, I mean, there was a there were people in in a Rome, a brothel, where the madam saved the Jewish family, and when the when the father wanted to give her money, she says, "No, you gave me the honor of saving your children." These were people who were humanitarians, and I have to say, I'm proud that so many Greeks were natural humanitarians. Um, we Thank lost tremend we lost tremendously, but. Thank you, Marsha. We're, we're, we're running a little bit over than normal, but this is a great topic. So I just want to I just want to have some closing remarks from everyone. We'll start. We'll start with uh, with uh, uh, Yanni. Yanni, if you can unmute yourself and just give us some uh, some last thoughts on uh, Ochi Day or anything else you would like, including what's happening right now in the Eastern Mediterranean. I leave it to you. Uh, unmute yourself. Un unmute yourself. Always I do the same, the same mistake. So okay. I'll, read, I'll just read only a letter of a Greek mother of nine sons in 1940. It is a letter to the prime minister of uh, Greece, uh, Alexandros Korizis. She writes, my son, Evangelos Ioannou Ioannidis, was lost in the operations of the Hellenic army in Klisura. I ordered to my four other sons, already serving the army, Christo, Costa, Giorgo, and Nico, Ioannou Ioannidi, to take revenge for the, death, for the death of their brothers. I keep in reserve four other sons, Pano, Athanasio, Gregorio, and Menelao, Ioannou Ioannidi, classes of duty, 1907 and later. Please call them to join the army by name and in any case of any need of our homeland or any other loss of my son to, av to avenge the enemy. Please inform our king that my last exclamation will be long life the motherland, Zito y Patrida, says <laughs> Eleni Ioannou Ioannidou, Ki Parisia, February 2, 1941. This is the Greek mother coming from Sparta, the ancient time. And after years, the, the, this mother has been honored by the local union of municipalities and communities of Attica and the municipality of Kiparisia under the auspice of the Greek parliament where she was proclaimed a symbol of the Greek mother of the epic of 1940. And 2009, her, stat her statue was un unveiled. So just only this, uh, Lou, in order to, 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 to apply honor to the Greek mothers. Yanni, thank you, thank you so much for joining us today. I, I am from Sparta. My, uh, my uncles, my dad was too young. He fought in the unfortunate uh, civil war that took place later. But uh, th three of his brothers fought in, uh, in, uh, in Epiros. Uh, one of them was permanently injured. Thank you. And, and you yourself are from Arta. Therefore, therefore, this has a special meaning to you in particular, those, those, great, those uh, brave people in the north, including the women who were fighting with stones. Uh, 
congratulations to you and thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you. Alexander, thank you, so much also. thank you. Alexander, some uh, final thoughts, words? Two thoughts, one symbolic, one concrete. Uh, the symbolic one is that uh, the information is that uh, one, maybe the first public performance by Frank Sinatra was a concert held at the Madison Square Garden in New York City, which a concert held in order to raise money for Greece. If that doesn't connect Greece with mainstream America, I don't know what else does. And more concretely, I think the Greek War Relief Association's activities, thanks to our HEPA and others, created a network, created logistics, created know-how, and that helped UNRWA, the United Nations Relief Organization, to give aid to Greece after that, uh, that unfortunate civil war and help a reconstruction. And by the same token, I think it inaugurated a period of greater confidence and relations between Greek Americans and Greece. So I think you know, October 1940 is, is a great moment, as I said, both for the ties between the Greek Americans to Greece and the fact that they were becoming more and more integrated into America. Thank you for joining us, Alexander. It's always a pleasure to, to have you. Uh, you obviously were with us last year and certainly over the years, whether it was at Holy Trinity Cathedral uh, during this occasion, uh, you've been nothing but... Uh, but a fantastic person and a, and a fountain of knowledge, quite frankly. Thank you again. Uh, Marcia, some uh, closing words. Okay, I am um, talking about what's happening now in the Eastern Mediterranean and putting it in the context of what happened 80 years ago. <clears throat> Once again, Greece and Cyprus are being confronted by overpowering enemies. Uh, I'm, I've done a lot of research in Cyprus. The main basis of my research was the work of Greek Cypriots in the British detention camps that were preventing Jews from getting into Palestine slash Israel mm -hmm. and the humanitarian actions that took place on the part of Greek Cypriots. My premise behind my research was who could better communicate with the Greek Cypriots than Greek speaking Jews? So I've been collecting eyewitness accounts of these people who received that comfort. There is now a park outside of Lanaka that has a very moving monument. It's the shape of a heart. And it says, my right side is in Israel. My left side remains in Cyprus. And these were children that were born in the detention camps. The uh, humanitarian, you know, I, I think people underestimate the humanitarian nature of Greeks, whether they may be residing in the United States or in Greece or in Cyprus. It's a basic part of their nature, thank God. And um, by the way, Alexander, in your research on uh, Greek Americans that fought uh, in the Albanian front or fought in World War II, please get in touch with me. I have a whole list of Greek Jews that I would like to add to your research. Okay. Will do. Uh, speak, speaking, of, uh, speaking of Cyprus, uh, unfortunately, uh, in the recent elections in the breakaway region in the north, uh, they elected uh, they elected Tar uh, Tartar uh, to be the uh, to be the prime minister of the breakaway republic. Uh, obviously, he's a, he's a fan and a, and an acolyte of uh, of Erdogan, and they're talking about you know their their thing is really to make uh, northern Cyprus uh, part of uh, you know part of Turkey eventually. And one thing that's disturbing to me, quite frankly, and I'm sure to all of us, is is what's taking place with regard to some of the nations. Uh, within the EU and also with NATO. I agree with the Council General that allies are extremely important, but at the same time, when you, when you are part of a union, you expect the union to be with you. You don't expect the union uh, to look the other way when certain things are taking place. Obviously, a lot of the things that have been taking place could have been dealt with over time and, and they weren't. Uh, so, uh, and also, uh, Marsha, to your point with regards to uh, Cyprus and, uh, and Israel and Jews, 
a lot of a lot of Israelis go to Cyprus to get married. I don't I don't know if many people know that. that <laughs> yeah, that's because of the religious aspect. No, no, I know. The, but um, I have a meeting on Tuesday. I'm part of the American Jewish Committee Cyprus team, and we actually we meet on a regular basis with. Uh, the Council General of Cyprus. And of course, the main thing on the topic is what's happening in the north of Cyprus there. And one other side note, historical note, if Erdogan knew anything about his history, he would know that when Agaturk, the father of modern Turkey, set up the, the uh, government, it was to be set up not as a religious state, but as a state that welcomes all. And so he should go back and read his history books, really. Yeah, but as we know, as we know, he has read his history books. And unfortunately, he's not looking to Ataturk, quite frankly, the founder of, modern, yeah. of modern Turkey. He's looking to the Ottomans. I know. Okay, he's, he's, yeah. looking, he's looking at the territories and has maps, quite frankly, that show parts of different countries as being part of his country. No, I, I, don't see, I, I don't see anyone in Greece coming up with a map that shows all of Turkey being somewhere else. I, I don't see those type of maps. Well, they could go back to ancient Greece. They can go back to the Byzantine Empire. It covered that same I, I, territory, you know? I, 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 think, I think intelligent people should realize that the borders are set and deal with each other in a, in a decent intellectual I, way. I agree with you. With, with that, uh, uh, Brother Jimmy, if you can, uh, 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 HEPA obviously is ha having its Supreme Convention in Athens uh, this coming year. If you can, just uh, uh, give some parting words and tell us our linkages uh, with, with the homeland and also what's happening with the HEPA Supreme Convention in July in Athens. Well, we're hoping that, God willing, this uh, pandemic has passed by then. We're hoping to be there in March to celebrate the 200-year anniversary of the, uh, freedom, you know, the freedom of, uh, of Greece, uh, 1821. Um, like I said, God willing, it passes. We'll be there in March and we'll be there again in July for our Supreme Convention to, again, celebrate that 200 year anniversary with our membership, our brothers in Greece, our brothers from here. Um, with regards to today's conversation, the last couple of years has been pushing its chapters to do more around Oshi Day. Uh, again, it's up to us to educate uh, our own people and to educate our represent representatives in government and our communities. Uh, the way that we get educated sometimes we don't know about different peoples and different nations in their history and the greatness that existed and the great acts that they've performed, it is up to us. Nobody's going to toot our horn for us. People are out there nowadays fighting for their own notoriety and their own publicity. Uh, it's up to us, like I said, to, to share the March 25th with the world and with everybody that we can and to share the, the, the October 28th day with the world and let them know what role modern Greece played in shaping today's society and, 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 and fighting for its freedom. Uh, Unfortunately, this year, given COVID, we were not able to do that. But the last couple of years, uh, as your chapter has, uh, the Delphi chapter has celebrated Ochi Day uh, and, and brought it to the attention of the, the local uh, elected officials and everybody else. Uh, other chapters throughout the country have done that. Obviously, this year we couldn't, but we were hoping to continue that. Uh, again, sharing our history, sharing our culture, sharing our successes and our contributions to the world. Uh, and I encourage everybody, if you don't happen to have a chapter, do, you, do it through your Greek school. Do it through your church. Invite the local local officials. It's not a big deal. If you have 50 or 100 people down, even if half of them are your own. Again, we must keep these things alive because if we don't keep them alive, nobody else will do it for us. Thank you again to you, Lou, and to everybody else who participated today for the, everything Thank that they're you. doing. Thank you. And do it also to your synagogue. Do it also to your synagogue. I want to yes, mention, yes. we have a Greek Jewish festival every May. We close down a street yes, on the do. Lower East Side. Yes, Please. A HEPA should have a free table over there. I welcome you to join us. Um, we, we couldn't do it this year. We probably will not be able to do it in 2021. But as soon as we're able to open up, um, you're welcome to Please tell Please let us know, Marshall. We're more than happy to help with the help and participate. OK, great. Thank you. Uh, Peter, Peter uh, some final words. But let me, let, me, uh, let me put some words in your mouth. Can you speak, can you speak to? those veterans who came back from the Balkan Wars uh, back to the United States and, and those veterans seeing their children in America and their thought process when the war broke out in the United States of America. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Very quickly, uh, not only did the, uh, the veterans that returned from the Balkan Wars uh, participate themselves in World War I, but their children uh, were anxious to get involved in World War II. 
And we have accounts locally through uh, many of the parishes and their newsletters of those individuals that uh, actually fought in World War II. So uh, I know Professor Kitreff is working on a project. I'm sure he's, started, he's tapped in on that. But many, many of those uh, children of Balkan War veterans uh, were first in line to uh, enlist and actually uh, fight in the American army. Uh, and many of their fathers not only had fought in the Balkan Wars, had actually fought in World War I as well. Um, I, I believe, uh, Lou, we've touched upon this a little bit. It's important for uh, Greeks as a, a humble people to set aside their humility and take their history and write it as it should be done. If we don't do that, and or we continue to write in Greek, it's not gonna serve any purpose. We have to take this, we have to be at the forefront. Um, and and I've, I've actually taken upon myself, as you all know, to do that in part. Uh, I chose to do the Balkan Wars and I chose to write it from the Greek American perspective. If we don't do that, and if we don't give this to at least those of the English speaking world, then what is the point? Uh, again, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that we're a humble people, but um, my grandfather fighting on the, on the front lines, he came back and he left Chios. He was forced to go to Limnos and it took d decades, 30 years for me to find out that my grandfather was in the resistance and that they would help move uh, Jews from Greece to Turkey. And it was not something that was talked about. They weren't, it wasn't for heroics. They weren't, you know, they never want the Lord about this. It was just something in passing. It was what they had to do. And uh, we're very proud of uh, who and what we've accomplished. But I think if we don't continue, Lou, like you're doing here, um, it's going to be lost. Thank you. So thank you so much, Peter. And I will, I will add that uh, for my family, about five members of my family joined right away. Uh, uh, the American army, for example, besides, besides the relatives I have in Greece, there were many in Greece who fought uh, during the occupation. They were obviously in the mountains and, uh, and many of my family members were actually killed uh, by, the, uh, by the Axis powers, by the, by the Nazis, etc. in Greece. Uh, for Alexander's sake, uh, the first, I believe, Greek American who died in the United States and is buried in the USS Arizona is a Katsos. His name is uh, George Katsos. He's buried there in the U.S. Um, uh, National Monument uh, relating, to, uh, relating to the war. I want to thank the panel for being with us. And I'd just like to discuss, uh, you know, the event we're having in a couple of weeks. It's on uh, Hellenic energy independence, and it's a forum. It's a panel discussion, and we'll have some of the leaders within the, uh, the energy field in Greece. And it, it relates to independence. In other words, energy independence. Because as we know, and as we head towards the 200th anniversary of the Hellenic Revolution, the high energy dependence of Elas has been an Achilles heel of its economy. And it will act as a hindrance, quite frankly, uh, to its growth, contribute to a weakening of its geopolitical strategic uh, position and create an, a reliance on third nations. Obviously it talks about, it talks about everything that we're discussing today, in particular, the modern time period within what's happening in, in the East Mediterranean and, uh, and the problems that are there. Also, uh, for, those who, who, for those who listen to us, they know that our focus this year, meaning EMCA and the, uh, and the Ahepa Hellenic Cultural Commission is on the upcoming 200th anniversary of the, of the Hellenic Revolution. We've had a few events around that topic and we're having a few uh, events, obviously, We've had a few events and we're having a few events. One of them will be on, uh, on the Hellenic, Phil Hellenic woman and their effect on the Hellenic revolution, which will be on December 13th. On, uh, on January 17th, we're gonna have uh, an event on the legacy of the Hellenic diaspora in the Hellenic revolution of 1821. On uh, January 31st, we're gonna have an event on the Hellenic orphans taken abroad uh, from 1821 through the 1960s. And in February, we'll have an event called the Phil Helene, the Hellenic Revolution, uh, Phil Hellenes and their effect on the American abolitionist and women's suffrage movement. Again, the Hellenic Revolution, just like Orchidae, is not just a Greek event. Mm -hmm. When it was taking place in 1821, it was an international event and it had effects throughout Europe. And it had particular effects 
on the United States of America. Those who came and fought in Greece from the America and Americans who came back to America became the leaders of the American abolitionist movement. Part of it, what they saw related to the slavery that was taking place during the 200, during the 400th uh, occupation of, of uh, the Greek mainland. With that, I, I'd like to give a couple of uh, email addresses. Uh, the first being uh, embca.com for our events. The other one being a hepa.org for those who are into a HEPA. And I just need one more for, um, for Kostas Tsurakis, who did an excellent job of singing a couple of, uh, uh, a couple of songs. Uh, his uh, website is www.tsurakis.com. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you, panel. You were absolutely spectacular. Apologies for overrunning, but this was a great event. Take care and thank you. Thank, thank you, Lou. Thank you. Thank you.